Hey everyone, hope you guys are having a good night or good morning or good afternoon, depending on wherever you are listening to this. Um, today we have a very special show planned. If you were here uh, the other night when we had uh, Dan Catula, who appears to be in the chat on, uh, he we were talking about the fraternity of Delta Chi. We had another special guest come on pretty late in that one, um, a man by the name of Eric Oaks, his son Adam was also a Delta Chi at a different university. And just to put it quite frankly, they hazed him to death. They targeted him because of his weight, singled him out, and continued to have a party while he he laid there. And so we're going to bring Eric on as well as Adam's cousin, Dr. Courtney White, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. and. One thing that I will say is I want to make a plug. We will watch this on here tonight, but there is a documentary. It's 22 minutes. It's really short. You should definitely watch it. It's called uh, The Death of a Death of a Pledge, The Adam Oak Story. Uh, Dan wrote and uh, directed that. It is very good. I watched it. It's quite emotional. And again, we're going to watch it again. <laughs> um, but, you know, what I've learned from some of my followers is that America is one of the only countries or, you know, not all the countries have fraternities. A lot of countries don't understand why we have them. And there seems to be a real problem where no matter how many years pass, no matter how many people die, they, no matter how many people get injured, they do nothing to fix it. So with that said, let me bring on Eric. I'll make you bigger there in a second, Eric. And... <laughs> I'm large Courtney, enough. Dr. Courtney White. <laughs> well, if you guys would like to introduce yourselves, please feel free to, to do so. And Courtney, your your mic is muted, just so you know. So uh, thanks for having us on, Justin. Um, my name's Eric Oaks. I'm the father of Adam Oaks. And uh, he was in his first year as a VCU student. And he was pledging the Delta Chi fraternity when he lost his life. And Courtney, do you want to do you? Sure. Um, I am Dr. Courtney White. I'm actually the oldest cousin of Adam Oaks. Um, and when he died, we um, took our grief into action to make change for other kids. Okay. And I think that's a great thing. And um, let's just jump right into this. So I, I want to point out that this story came to my attention uh, during Riley's strain, you know, I live in Nashville, we were searching for him. And, and I do want to say that obviously his fraternity where nobody's blaming his fraternity or his brothers for his, his death. His, at this point, there's nothing that indicates that they were involved other than just the fact that they didn't see him out or help him get anywhere else. And that's not a crime, especially if you're a guy, mo I can't tell you how many times I wandered off from the bar when I was in college and my friends would be like, do you need somebody? I'm like, no, I'm fine. And I would just wander off and walk three miles home. It's, in hindsight, it was probably a really dumb idea. But um, what we can say that happened that's very similar between the two stories is that Riley's brothers clammed up. They didn't help search. I actually learned tonight, and you don't know this yet, Eric um, or Courtney, but uh, somebody reached out to me over one of the videos I did, basically kind of getting on me for condemning the brothers. And in this thing she sent me, uh, she basically told me that on Friday night, they searched till 5 a.m. They searched one night <laughs> till 5 a.m. And then they got up. I'm not trying to laugh. That's not funny. But a complete stranger searched longer than their supposed friends. And then they went back to Mizzou. They shut up. Uh, it is my understanding um, in the comments that some people I had in that video, I had heard at the time that I had not seen anybody show up. People are contradicting that saying that there were. Um, I've not seen anybody send me anything, but I'm open to the idea of that. And if they did, great. But something was similar with y'all's story too, right? When Adam was basically hazed to death, and we'll talk about how that happened in a second, they clammed up, they got quiet, they didn't say anything. And so that seems to be the routine that they do, is they just get quiet when this kind of stuff happens. 
So before we get into exactly what happened, uh, Eric, I'm going to put this one on you. Do you want to tell a little bit about um, about how Adam was was a kid? Are you okay doing that? Yeah, absolutely. And how he was as your son? Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I guess first to start off, uh, Adam was a miracle child. Linda and I tried for many years to conceive. Um, it just wasn't in the cards for us. And then one day, you know, she was pregnant with Adam. And uh, I mean, he was he was a gift from God. Um, his whole life, I mean, he he never gave us any problems. He he was always a good kid. He, um, you know, he he was a normal kid growing up. He played little league t ball and baseball, basketball in the rec leagues. Um, played peewee football. Um, he, I guess as he got older, he he started to put on some weight. Um, but we joke jokingly said, you know, it's more more of you to love. Um, Linda and I are both big, so it, it's somewhat in the genetics. But um, you know, he 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 was a great kid. He was a good friend um, to all his friends. Um, he was always there for them. You know, if uh, they ever needed something, he was there. Um, he had a great group of friends in high school um, that they nicknamed themselves the boys. It's about 10 to 15 of them, and they're a very tight-knit group. Um, you know, so uh, when Adam went to VCU, uh, a lot of these uh, boys also went to VCU. It's about two hours away. There's closer schools to us. And, you know, I, I talked to Adam about what school do you want to go to? And he had actually thought it through. It was at the height of COVID. Um, I mean, just the whole senior year was uh, a wash because he didn't get to graduate, you know, typically when the way other kids graduate, you know, in a big group with all his friends. Um they were sequestered in his freshman year at VCU. Um, they weren't allowed to, um, you know, do study together. Uh, most of his classes were online, and he's more of a in-person type, you know, learner. Um, which I'm the same way. It's hard to learn online. Um, you know, so I guess after he started uh, college. He, um, I don't know, he was having problems meeting friends. Um, I mean, he had friends, don't get me wrong, but um, he had the group of friends that came from Potomac Falls High School where we live. And, uh, you know, he had really good friendships there. Uh, they just all decided together to um, uh, pledge this one particular fraternity because they had a brother that was already in um uh, in the the fraternity and so um i don't know he he really wasn't a risk taker and so this was a big risk for him uh to to join a fraternity like this um i don't even know if i don't know if everybody's on the show left no we're still here we're just giving you the 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 yeah. platform <laughs> okay yeah i saw everybody disappear i'm like am i still here sorry everybody um i'm not familiar with this platform so and first off i want to thank everybody too um because i see the chats and um you know i really appreciate everybody's uh, uh positive attitude and um understanding what we're going through uh, it's it's tough i mean it happened three years ago um you know, we, we miss him. He was our only child. Um, we can't understand why, you know, God would give us a gift and then take it away so abruptly. You know, it's not like he was going to, you know, Afghanistan or somewhere. I mean, he was going to college. You, you don't die going to college. This is crazy. And uh, I don't know. I, I babbled enough here. So, um, but I just, just to let you know about Adam, he was a, a, a great, he had a great sense of humor. He was extremely bright. He graduated with, um, in Virginia, they have something called um, 
uh, like an honors diploma, um, and he graduated with that. So, I mean, he was extremely bright. Um, you know, our lives are ruined because he's not here anymore. And um, we go around and we speak at, at colleges and high schools, um, advocate for bills to be passed to try and bring awareness so people understand that this is a problem. I mean, I, I have I have lost my child, you know, and I'm here advocating for your kids and your grandkids. I'm not going to have grandkids. Linda and I won't have grandkids. And I'm sorry. I, like I said, I babbled enough. I know Courtney wants to say hi. No, I, I agree with everything that you're saying. I just, um, when you showed his picture, like that, that right there is Adam. Like what you couldn't see is the smile, the ginormous smile that he constantly had on his face. Um, we spent every holiday together and then he lived right down the street from me. Um, so we were very close. And in that time, I mean, since he was born, he walked into a room, gave you a hug. He left the room, gave you a hug. You never once had to question whether he loved you or not because he said it all the time. He always wanted people to know how he felt about them. And he always seized that moment. And he wasn't afraid to show um, show his affection to people. He didn't care what people thought. He hugged his buddies just like he hugged his family. And that was just Adam. Um, Adam was a huge Kevin Durant fan and a Russell Westbrook fan. He was um, an avid basketball fan, period. Uh, loved the 49ers since I don't even know when. Um, and so he could argue any statistic that ever was, and he would argue till he was blue in the face. And nine out of 10 times he was correct. Um, and you would have to just bow, like, you know, just uh, – take yourself out of the argument because he just was so knowledgeable about sports. Um, the type of kid Adam was, is that when, when the police took his phone, the things that they found on his phone were Pokemon cards and pictures of his little cousins. Like that's, that tells you what kind of kid Adam was, is that he was just a big kid at heart and that he truly loved his family. Cause those were the things that were on his phone when he passed. Um, so that's that's just Adam and that big amazing smile that you can see in the picture that you showed. Well, I appreciate you guys sharing and introducing. And what I've learned from talking to y'all and talking to Dan um, is that he just seems like he was a beautiful soul, and he definitely deserves to be known. His story deserves to be known, and and you all deserve validation. And that's that's the goal here. And you know, I, I hate the fact that it takes the loss of another Delta Chi member, different circumstances, obviously, to bring this to the forefront, but it seems like a good time to to bring it up. So that being said, we, we're going to watch, we can watch Death of the Pledge. Dan gave us permission to do that. Uh, might we put credits in there and he'll sign off on whatever we have to do. But um, before we do that, and again, if I overstep or something you're not comfortable or whatever, mm -hmm. please feel free. But... Um, Talk, well, I guess first, before we talk about what happened that night, did you, how long had he been pledging when this happened? How long had he been part of this fraternity, Delta Chi? Um, yes. Yeah. This was his first night, his first night as a Delta Chi. First was night. Pledged. Yep. So in their um, traditions and rules, and I hope I'm not overstepping by going ahead and just giving kind of like how it went down is he had been to some rush events. Some were virtual, some were in person. Um, and mainly he was still like kind of back and forth between home and VCU because all the classes were virtual. So, uh, when he, he pledged or he was rushing Delta Chi and there was one other fraternity that we later found out he was interested in and they were interested in him. Um, Delta Chi, when they gave him their the bid, basically he was like, well, I'm not down there yet. I'll be down there next week. They were like, no, you have to come down now and you have to be here in person. You can't be virtual. So they kind of like pulled at him a little bit, persuaded him to come down. And he was only down for a night and only a Delta Chi for a night. So his first night of the pledge process was this big little night. Um, and it was it ended up being his last it's absolutely, obviously, tragic. 
I didn't know it was the first night. I thought he'd been pledging for a little while. So that's. Yeah, it's it's terrible no matter what, but I feel like it makes it a little bit worse knowing that. Um, that and he he was taken as what's called an underground pledge. So I think this is crucial for all parents to know. But a lot of the fraternities, they take what are called underground pledges. The underground pledges are taken um, undocumented, meaning that they maybe didn't meet the GPA requirement. Or sometimes they even take members that aren't even university students as underground pledges. They take them undocumented because they don't make the requirements that national headquarters of Delta Chi wants to see. So they kind of take them under the radar. There was an entire pledge class taken in 2018 of the Delta Chi VCU where Adam was pledging, the entire pledge class was underground. It was about eight to nine kids in that one single pledge class. So Adam was taken into the fraternity as what's called an underground pledge because his GPA was not quite high enough to be accepted as an, a member um, or as a legitimate pledge. So the sad part is though, he went and got a suit because they told him to get a suit. He went and did all these things, getting, you know, anticipating being um, pinned. And they give you a cornerstone book and they make you learn the history of the fraternity. Right. He didn't get to do any of that because he was an underground pledge. They treated the underground pledges worse than they treated the actual pledges. So because he was an underground pledge, he was kept off of the hazing prevention webinar that all the students were supposed to receive. So he was literally seven of the pledges got the, the hazing prevention webinar. Adam did not. So he was left off that email entirely because he was underground pledging. Um, that night of the ceremony, they took all of the seven pledges that were not underground. They took them out to dinner, got them their pins, gave them their cornerstone books. But the three that were underground pledges didn't get to go to dinner, were taken to a park, told that they were going to be dropped off and had to find their way back in the dark. Um, just all kind. There's just, um, there's a line between how they treated the pledges and how they treated the underground pledges. There's also a line where you'll see throughout the video, um, we'll kind of rip the veil off in a way um, after the video of what really happened behind the scenes and what we really found out about this case but you find out that the underground pledges were treated differently as well when it came to the drinking that night too. Two of the three were left behind in the fraternity house while everybody else's big brothers took them to their houses. So it's really important that people understand that underground pledging is so incredibly dangerous because these kids, there's no paperwork on these kids. They're treated differently. They're treated worse in most cases than the other kids are. Um, and they're taken out of, in all honesty, desperation to keep the numbers up. They're like, we'll take you now. And then the hope is, is that by the time your pledging is done, you'll have brought your grades up so that they can initiate you with everybody else. Um, so what I, be, I want to talk about um, the night that, that he passed and what happened. But before I do, I do want to make it known. And I think that I told you, Eric, that I was going to do this. And Courtney, I don't know if I told you I was. But a few nights ago, I emailed a man by the name of Carl, with a K, Grindle, who is the executive director and CEO of Delta Chi at the national level. And I invited him on about with between the silence that the pledges had with Riley Strain and the um, silence that they had when Adam passed. And said, let's just come on, have a conversation about fraternity. You know, this is really, it's, it's not confrontational. Just come on um, if you want to. And I did end it saying, though, if I don't, if you say no, or if you don't respond at all, then I'll let, I'll make sure that viewers know this. And, and I'll say this too from the other night. Uh, I believe that somebody from that fraternity is probably watching this on some, some platform somewhere. And the reason I say that was because the other night when we were talking about Riley Strain and Eric came on earlier, um, I had pulled up the website for Delta Chi National and there was no, you know, Eric, you saw it. You were here with me. There mm -hmm. was no tribute to Riley Strain. The next morning there was on the national site. The, the chapter site, the Mizzou chapter site had something up the whole week. So let's not get confused with that. But um, I just want that to be known that, you know, they were invited to come here. 
knowing that this was going to happen several days ago and they chose to just not respond at all. Um, no. You know, and the goal of this is to try to change the way things are done because this is the way this has been done for a long time. If I, Dan will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that last year was the first time in 50 years there wasn't a hazing related death. No, that's so, true. And that's true. Okay. Years, that's true. And then another thing to just note is when Adam died, it was the same exact thing. Not a single brother showed up to that funeral except for the one that was from his high school at Potomac Falls. That's it. Not a single brother. No one reached out with condolences. Uh, the national acknowledged his passing, did not acknowledge that he was even a brother. Um, and that was that. That was it. There was no. Um, there yeah, was I just no want to mention, too, that, that, that the 2023, there was no deaths. That's right now reported. So that doesn't mean it didn't right. happen somewhere. And then eventually the story will get out or the parents will, you know, talk about it and it'll get investigated and then they'll find out that there were. So sometimes it takes a month, mm -hmm. uh, six months to a year before um, the story gets out. It took them two days to acknowledge that Adam died at his university. So two days it took and only after we totally like media blasted Adam's passing and made them um, acknowledge it. Did they actually say that a student had died in an off campus fraternity house? So they they don't always um, I think they try to first like investigate and sometimes just take care of it on the side. So you don't ever hear about it. But that was not going to be the case for Adam's. There's a lot of people so, having questions and stuff. I just want to try and catch up because they're they're going by so fast. Um, we didn't find out that this was premeditated until well after the criminal charges were were placed and they were already sentenced and completed their um, their sentencing. So it was probably two years after Adams passed and did we find out that all these things were premeditated and they were planned events. So I want to talk about the night that everything happened. And I read, and I was talking with Dan a little bit earlier about this. Um, there was an article back from when this happened that said that he was given 40 ounces. Is that correct? Was it 40 or was it a, it was 40. Okay. He was given a of alcohol. He was given a handle of Jack Daniels. And then on top of that, Jack Daniels, he was turned around and they were giving them beer too. They were also making them play this game called bull moose where you had to drink out of your right hand. If at any point they caught you not drinking out of that right hand, then you had to chug what was left in your drink. And for some of these kids, it was pure, pure liquor. So think about that. The more you get caught not drinking out of your, the correct hand, the more liquor you're drinking, the more you're going to forget to drink out of that right hand. So we're not even sure even after he finished that handle, how much more he had um, in the cup from the bull moose game too. And I know that they did some sort of chugging of whatever was left in their drinks. They did like this honorary circle of pledging to the Delta Chi fraternity and like a chant thing too. Yeah. And, and before y'all tell the story of the night, uh, 40 ounces of alcohol, maybe more, and a BAC of a BAC of 4.0, correct? Or higher? 0 0.419. 0, 0. 0.419? 0. 0.419 was his BAC at the time of death. And then he he had about 0. 0.001 of caffeine, which is less than in a cup of coffee. So if that tells you anything about what he was drinking, it was literally pure liquor. Very limited caffeine was processed in his system. All right. Well, Eric, I'm going to give it over to you. And if you want to share, I guess, Courtney, if you want to, which whoever wants to um, share what happened that night. Eric, do you want me to go? Or so you I guess, yeah, you can go ahead. So Adam was... Basically, he was coerced to come down because it had to be an in-person event. He later that morning or Friday morning, he found out um, he asked if he was to wear the suit. The president of the fraternity said, no, don't worry about it. 
um, just meet at, you know, they were supposed to meet at Monroe Park. Unfortunately, it started raining. So they said, change of plans, meet at Pine Street. And this is one of the secondary houses of Delta Chi. So Adam and another underground pledge that was being taken met up at Adam's dorm. They walked to the house together. When they arrived at the house, there was really nobody else there except for some of the brothers that stayed behind. They were told to get in the car, put your phones away, heads down, um, and they were driven to Monroe Park and dropped off um, and said, basically, find your way back to the fraternity house. When the boys didn't know where they were going, the three guys that were dropped off didn't know where they were going. They didn't know where the other pledges were. They really had no idea what was going on. So the boys that were had dropped them off, squealed wheels, came around the corner, got them again, said it was just a practical joke, and drove them to 138 West Clay Street, where the rest of the night takes place. Adam and the two other boys were told to wait up in the room for the other kids to come back. The other kids came back from dinner and celebrating, you know, their milestone of getting the pin, getting pinned and the cornerstone and at this time, there was no advisor there, but before there was an advisor there, and he had been their advisor for 10 years. So I say that because that's important for you all to know that, yes, there was a grown adult there. And yes, that grown adult knew what was going to happen the rest of the night and did nothing to stop it. So Adam um, and the rest of the boys all got up in this one upstairs bedroom. They were going to be told who their big brothers were and matched up. They had to come down the stairs and so when Adam came down, you know, as Adam is uh, paired with Andrew White, when you get paired up, your big has already made your drink and Andrew had already made Adam's. Adam and Andrew, uh, like, you know, tap, tap cups and then they chug the drink that's in the cup. When Adam comes back down the stairs, Andrew hands him this handle of liquor and basically says, I drink mine, you should drink yours. At that point, Andrew introduces Adam to his grand big. His grand big is kind of like your, your big brother's brother, big brother. So it's like you're a fraternity or sorority family. Um, at that point, they hung out with Adam a majority of the night. Adam had that handle bottle done in less than two hours. I think it was less than two hours. Um, we know that the drink that Andrew had given him was so strong that somebody actually told Andrew to put more caffeine in it, put, put more Coke in it, put more something. And Andrew kind of laughed it off and was like, um, you know, it's good the way it is, basically. And then someone noticed that his bottle for Adam was way bigger than the bottles for the other kids. And Andrew was like, well, a big bottle for a big boy kind of thing, just basically assuming that Adam could handle more alcohol than everybody else because he was a bigger kid. Um, Andrew basically told Adam to go outside and throw up, tried to get him to throw up because he thought if he threw up, he would be in, in better shape than what he was because he knew he could tell he was already getting drunk. He says that Adam threw up, but the medical examiner told us there was no residue in Adam's esophagus to prove that he had thrown up at all. Um, so there's varying versions of the story. Uh, at this point, Adam comes back in from attempting to throw up and his legs buckle from underneath of him. So he's, he's really drunk at this point. It takes about five guys to get him into the dining room. By the time they get him to the dining room, he's just dead weight and they lay him on the ground and get him, um, they, they got him a glass of water uh, they basically just kept telling him lay down, lay down kind of thing because he was he was drunk. And then at that point, just left him there. And then they proceeded to party all around him. So in the front room by Adam, there was one pledge that had already puked on himself and was passed out on the couch. There was another pledge down in the basement that was sleeping in his own vomit because he had gotten so drunk and thrown up. And then there were kids outside puking as well. They were puking so loud that four 911 calls were made to get help. And not a single one of those 911 calls was listened to. 
No one came, not a single Richmond City police officer came. And then even in the notes says that one was dispatched to go over there or told to go over there and that person never showed up. So that's a what if that we'll always live with. Um, Andrew says he checked on Adam, you know, periodically through the night. He says Adam was snoring. Adam did not snore. So we feel that Adam's body was dying then when Andrew said he was snoring. This is all, you know, we're finding this out the week after he's he's died. We don't know any, you know, this is just kind of the pledges stories that we're all kind of putting together. Um, what happened and how it happened and, and all of that. Um, throughout the night, they have what's called a pulse checker. So somebody to go around and check the pulse of the pledges to make sure that they're alive. They have a risk management chair who lives in the house and who is supposed to be making sure this, you know, this is safe. And about 40 boys walked in and out and around and kept partying and chugging while Adam laid there dying and no one, no one got him help. So by the time that he was found the next morning, he, we, he had been dead for hours and the medical examiner has told us repeatedly that if any one of them had picked up the phone and called 911, he'd still be there with us today. Um, that's kind of a broad version of the story. I think as you start to show scenes from the video, we can kind of fill in those gaps. But I do preface before we watch this that the video was made before um, before a lot of the truth came to the surface. And what I mean by that is the criminal in the criminal charges, there was zero evidence collected. So something that fraternities do is they sign each other's bottles. So the big and the little sign bottles, no bottles were collected with Adam. Um, there was no subpoena of cell phones. The only cell phone that they took was Adam's. They never once took a single brother's phone except for Adam's. Um, they didn't even interview in the police reports that I have access to. They never interviewed the big brother. So very huge, huge gaps in in the investigation. 911 calls were deleted um, by a 20-year veteran on the force. Just things over and over and over that spiraled into a, a really crummy investigation and is part of the reason that we now travel and teach police how to investigate hazing cases. Okay, thank you. For thanks for sharing all that. And so just so you guys know, to understand what she's saying here, and I'll, I'll break this one part down. They gave him a ridiculous amount, a lethal amount of alcohol. They gave him more than they gave the other pledges because they assumed by his size he could handle more, which, by the way, I'm just going to tell you guys all right now, I don't care how big or how little you are. For the most part, we all have the same system, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're 400 pounds or you're 100 pounds. You still have the same system. Um, there's but also, they continue to... Oh, sorry, sorry. There's also something called tolerance. You know, you build up a tolerance. Um, and Adam wasn't a drinker, so he didn't have a tolerance. He didn't, he didn't build up. Um, and then the first thing I want to mention is, you know, the first solo cup that they handed him of alcohol was eight to 10 shots. We're, we're not sure how many exactly, but it was a lot. So usually you have that over, you know, if you're going to, if you're a big drinker, you'd have that over what, three hours worth of time. Every 20 minutes, you'd have a shot. He had it all at one time, all in his system. I mean, it was just horrible. So while that was all going on, the other thing too, that know is they, partied over him mm -hmm. while this was going on they partied over him it's just despicable but let's couldn't even let's watch. Oh, like they just couldn't even put him on a couch they couldn't do you know what i mean like they couldn't even give him the respect to put him in a more comfortable place like you'll see in like he's in the on the ground in the dining room and he was left there like a piece of trash it's just they put him on the floor yeah they put the him on the floor, floor of this disgusting
fraternity house, the EMT that came the next the next morning said it was the most disgusting scene he'd seen. Like he, he scarred because of the way that he saw. And, he, and he's a first responder in the yeah. city of Richmond. You know, he's seen some horrific things. A lot of things. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll start it and we might stop it um, and talk about it. But let's let's show up for you guys. You got his name? They said his name is Adam Oaks. Uh, got a young male born in 1999, I think it was. He doesn't live here. He's a student at VCU. Got four guys here. I guess they were partying last night. They saw him around about 12, 30 last night. Came back down this morning around about 9, 17. He was unresponsive. Did you see the final right by yeah, the fence? Yes. Side. It could have been anything. It could have been the alcohol. It could have been just the fact he passed out and that was it. Hit his face and then took the dive. Hey, um, was he intoxicated last night? Um, yeah. I mean, his brother, big brother, and he didn't find out who he was and what. So he didn't affect it. He wanted to be He wanted to be interested. Interesting. He wants to some, be. He was a pledge. You think it was some problem? Based, based, based off of what you're saying about this cat that was here that wasn't here, sounds like there was a. Uh, want to ride? You guys are affected. Good time. Tonight, a Virginia family is searching for answers. The Richmond Police Department says it has no updates in an ongoing investigation. Police found the 19-year-old VCU student unresponsive. Adam Oaks was excited to find out he was invited to join Delta Chi fraternity. Now the 19-year-old student is dead. Adam was offered a bid to join Delta Chi. He had to go to a party on Friday night to start the initiation process. An initiation party they suspect involved hazing and alcohol. Oaks was told to drink an entire bottle of whiskey. Adam passed out at the fraternity house and was discovered dead there Saturday morning. They whipped him over and half his face was normal and then the other half was purple. Adam Oaks's heartbroken family says they will not let grief stop them from demanding answers. We deserve answers. <laughs> Adam deserves answers. Adam was super happy. He was always, you know, joking around, having fun. The last time I picked him up there, he gave me a hug that was life changing. And I thought, I was like, that's the best hug I've ever had in my life. And he just said, I know, right? Even for an 18 year old kid, he was so good to his little cousins. I mean, my kids looked up to him so much and he loved being around them. One was when he was in Pee Wee football. He tackled a boy and the boy was hurt. Adam came running out and I was in the stands. I came down and I said, what was wrong? What, what, what happened? He said, daddy, that was my friend. And I heard him and I was telling him I'm sorry. I walk into the house and Adam was already there. Very first time I saw him, I looked at it. The first thing I ever said to him too is, you know, this guy, I like this guy, you know? Adam was very, very outgoing, very, very funny. Just always had that smile on his face at all times. He's very easy to talk to, very easy to be friendly with, like always talking about sports, always talking about something that like gauges your attention. I knew Adam to be like a really nice guy just from, from how I always saw him smiling, 
I would always tell the guys, if anyone gets a bid, it needs to be him. On the way to my house, I stopped by the liquor store. I bought a regular bottle of Jack Daniels and then I bought a bigger one. Early evening, the kids are all at a house, essentially taking their vow to the fraternity. They wait up in a bedroom to be brought down one by one on the staircase to meet their big brother which is the big little ceremony with all the brothers lining at the bottom of the staircase and then one brother on the staircase announcing. And next up is Adam Oaks. And his big is Andrew White. And then everybody starts cheering and Andrew would have a drink. And the idea is, of that is that you chug the drink. After that, I gifted him the bottle that I bought for him. And then I explained to him how when I was in his position, you know, I finished mine. Even though you're not telling him to down this bottle, like it's understood that you know people are going to get drunk. Even if there's no malicious intent, like it's it's the riskiest night of the semester. And Jason kind of had like a pep talk with them, and was like, "The intention of tonight is to get as f-ed up as you possibly can." And so he made his first cup, and uh, it was straight liquor, and pulled it back like it was water. Adam finished the bottle in which case he was intoxicated, but so were all the other boys. I was kind of relieved that he finished it so fast. And so I was like, okay, dude, congrats. Like we finished it. Now it's time to throw up. And so we went outside. I pulled Trig after I did, he felt comfortable. So he put his fingers in his mouth and made himself throw up. And so after that happened, my guard went completely down. I thought everything was okay. I thought everything would be fine. A lot of the big brothers took their little brothers to their houses to watch over them, but Adams didn't. So after X amount of time goes by, I'm looking around, I'm like, where is he? And uh, that's when I see him back out on the balcony, and he's kind of leaned over it like he's throwing up again. So I go out to check on him, and then I saw his legs start to buckle. And that's the first when I noticed he was very drunk. And so that's when I waved up a bunch of guys. We uh, helped him inside found a spot on the floor, we gave him a pillow, laid him down. We all scrambled around to get a pillow, a blanket, and a bottle of water, and um, helping put him down on the ground. And then uh, he fell asleep, you know, within a few minutes. I remember telling myself back ahead just to watch him and see if he needs anything, and, you know, don't leave the room. I could tell he was he was very drunk, but at the time, like, I didn't think much of it because I just thought, okay, maybe he needs water, maybe he's going to sleep it off or something. And then I think Andrew stayed with Adam for a little bit, but then thought Adam was fine and also thought he heard Adam snoring, but Adam didn't snore. And that's why I think that Adam was starting to die then. I'm checking on him throughout the night and saw no problems. You know, I I honestly didn't have a worry in the world. I thought everything was going to be fine. So I went around the room. I'm like, hey, guys, it's fine, right? He looks fine. So I left and... I completely just expected to wake up the next morning, bring him a Gatorade or something, and take him out to brunch. And then when I woke up at like 9 a.m., that's when I found out. One of the brothers that lived in the house called me, and I just froze for a second and didn't really quite grasp what was going on. In the group chat, guys were saying, you know, oh my God, Adam's dead, Adam's dead. And, you know, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking they're f-ing with me. You know, I'm, you know, people say, oh, they're dead, passed out, drunk, oh, he's dead. I'm like, oh, he's dead asleep, you know what I mean? But then it started to get a little more serious, like, no, he's, he's f-ing dead. Like, he's not waking up. I was actually, you know, watching TV and um, Linda was asleep and I heard a bang on the door and I looked through the ring and it happened to be three Loudoun County sheriffs. And I can remember walking down the hall in the house to get Linda. I just felt something was really, really wrong. And immediately I was in denial. I was like, whatever. (laughs) Tell me why you're really here. Eric just immediately, just screaming, no. It just felt like something came in and ripped my heart out you know just knowing that your only child the the one that you'd cared for the one that you prayed for for many years was gone adam never did anything without linda and linda never did anything without adam just wasn't 
I mean, sometimes Linda would go and check Adam out of school just because she missed him. I used to stay up because Adam was the only child and he didn't have any siblings to play with, so I'm the one playing Call of Duty, and <laughs> we'd stay up all night, like till 4 o'clock in the morning. And then when he got older, he was going out with his friends, and he would call me at 4 o'clock in the morning to come get him. Oh, I miss those phone calls at 4 in the morning. My dad um, was actually... Uh, he had stage four cancer, and I had to go over and break the news to him that his grandson died. And it's one of the hardest things to do because, you know, he loved Adam a lot. It was hard to pick up the pillow he slept on. It was hard to see the place where he lived. He still had packages that were mailed to him from my grandma, that he'll never open. Planning your own child's funeral is the worst. It's just the worst feeling that, that, that you could have as a parent, as a person. We sat in the living room and really we just cried. And then a couple of his friends started to talk about memories and, and start about talk about good, you know, good stuff. Um, but then eventually that good stuff turns to anger. Like, why did this happen? What happened? Because a 19 year old kid isn't just found dead. Hold on. There we go. So I'm going to get Courtney back up on here. I'm going to pause right there. There we go. I can get, I can work this thing. There we go. <laughs> um, Courtney, you're still muted just so you know, but, uh, all right, this is where you guys wanted to pause right before we get to the criminal. Mm -hmm. You doing okay? You doing okay, Eric? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I just what, want to mention. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go. No, you go ahead. I was just going to mention. Um, we were, were talking about punishment for these young men. Um, a year in jail is all Virginia would the max penalty and in the city of richmond um they just weren't putting young white um no criminal for hazing crime it just wasn't going to happen so we had to come up with something creative and we thought the best way to educate young people is to have other young people them go go and present with them with us to to them grieving family can sit and say whatever they want to and you feel sorry for them but when a young person your peer tells you don't think this can't happen to you it can and it did happen to us um we thought it 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 was huge and so this video is on youtube so if you want to hear your children um you, you feel free to you know to to show it and you want to show it to your school you know um you can definitely bring it up to the schools and they can show it um because it's especially for like senior classes um seen you know seniors that are getting ready to go to college it's it's it's, it's very important that they understand um what they're about to embark on um but anyway i just up to this point i just wanted to make that's the DA was definitely um, working with us explaining the predicament we're in in the state of Virginia. Now, other states had their felonies to haze someone to death. Um, and we also told that um, it would be hard pressed to find a jury to convict these guys on involuntary manslaughter. So in, in the state of Virginia, they're letting people out of jail rather than incarcerating them. So this is also what he was told. So this is not true. There have right. been hazing cases where in the state of Virginia that have been tried as manslaughter. In Adam's mm -hmm. case, they weren't willing to push it. And so that that was a very I, I just have to be very honest with everybody. That's what that was a very hard conflict for all of us because though yeah. the boys deserved to, to be held accountable for what happened 
And I think that we had a lot of mixed messages and we trusted the wrong people. That's just my opinion. I think they should have spent jail time um, in the Richmond City Jail. I feel like what they did was premeditated, was planned, mm -hmm. was um, cold and calculated. And they knew that they were going to be holding this event and that each of these kids was going to get a different bottle of alcohol that they were going to be told to drink because this tradition that they are that they did that night is is hundred uh, over a hundred years old for fraternities and sororities have done the big little tradition for forever. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just, it, it has to stop somewhere. And until we start holding people accountable for their actions, they're never going to learn from them. And this tradition is going to continue. So in the state of Virginia, hazing someone to the point of death is a class one misdemeanor kids can get, or people can get up to a year in jail and a thousand dollar fine. And that's it for killing someone or bodily injury to the point where they can't walk. That's still a misdemeanor. So it's a felony to abuse an animal, but it is not a felony in the state of Virginia mm -hmm. to abuse a human being to the point of their death. Um, and that is a very hard pill to swallow in our state and is part of the reason that we have made it our mission to change the laws um, around hazing in the state of Virginia. So that is another part that we'll get to a little bit later about what our foundation does. But Eric, it, it's, I think we got some very conflicting situations where people weren't willing to go further than, than that. And so Dan was able to get the boys in the video because it was part of the plea deal that they had with police that they would be in the video for um, for our our presentations. And when they came around and spoke with us, I mean that wasn't easy for them to do. I'm not credit. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, you know, it's easy to sit there in a, in in a jail cell and mark off days on a calendar until you get out, whether 30 days or whatever they would have got. Um, it's much harder to go to 10 presentations, speak in front of kids and these high, uh, college kids, I mean, they grilled them, you know, they asked them tough questions and they were angry with them and we were. And uh, so uh, we, we also asked the DA, you know, to get their phones um, because if they had more of this evidence, premeditated planning, maybe we could have got involuntary manslaughter or manslaughter charges. So, but they were, they said, we don't need it. That's what I was told. And every time I asked for something, they said, we can't do that. We can't do that. Meaning charge for manslaughter. Um, why not seven counts? There were seven pledges, you know, not just Adam. Adam was the only one. I said, give all these guys seven counts. Then it's seven years you're talking about. No, can't do that. I'm like, I mean, they, they claim it's, you know, it's such a broken system and everybody that's being incarcerated, you know, it's, it's broken for them. It's really broken for, you know, the, the victim, the victim. Um, Adam, Adam got no justice. Anyway, I'm off my soapbox. Let me, let me ask this. So we watched this. I know that we've had some conversations in that video where he talks about taking Adam out to throw up and he did. I mean, he's, we know he's lying in that, right? Like, if you talk to him, he swears up and down that's the truth. But we, I mean, we literally, I spoke to the medical examiner twice and two different times she said there was no, so when someone throws up, there's usually residue in your esophagus. There was none of that with Adam. No residue whatsoever, she said. So no, he did not throw up. And this kid told us he threw up multiple times. Not just once, multiple. But and, she's telling us the medical expert is telling us something, and, and she said that the esophagus would have had. Stuff. And Adam had those little knobbies in his teeth uh, from having the spine, and it's kind of like braces. And so, when if he had thrown up, there would have been some the braces. And she said there was no no residue, no res, you know, evidence of any of him throwing up. She didn't say that. She said the esophagus was where she did not see any residue. And she said, so I have not seen any evidence that he threw up, which means his body was processing 
all of that alcohol at such a rapid rate until it just couldn't take anymore. It just started to shut down. And that's when his breathing. I mean, basically, basically what they did within a, within a few short hours is they, they poisoned him to death. Right. I mean, that's they, what they did. They, I, yeah. they poisoned so, him. So I always say that, that, the fraternity killed Adam and the tool they used was alcohol. And, and again, I want to remind people as we're talking about this, that this is, this is a different Delta Chi chapter, but it's the same fraternity that Riley strain was part of the same fraternity that didn't go out and search and look for him and the same fraternity that turned their backs on Adam qu um, quite, you know, clammed up. And my understanding, and I, I think this is the right story. You might've told me this, Dan might've said it, but when this happened, they, let's back up because I don't think this is in the video. If I recall correctly, they weren't even supposed to be an active chapter, correct? If they had, so in 2018, they were suspended for various reasons. Uh, hazing, providing alcohol to a minor, assault charges, like against other fraternities. They were fighting other fraternities. They even had charges where they like lit some homeless guy's couch on fire. They, it was that rough. They were supposed to be suspended for four years. Four years. If they had been suspended for those four years, they wouldn't have been back on campus until 2022. A lawyer was hired by the National to come down and defend this chapter to get the charges reduced to a one year suspension and it was successful. And so in that time, they were able to get back on, on campus, be a well-known you know, fraternity again. And in the process, they were able to take pledges and Adam died as a part of that. And then- And, and, not, and not only did they give them a one year suspension, they gave them one year suspension time served, correct? Mm-hmm. So they were basically immediately able to come back on. And they picked and chose who stayed as a part of the fraternity. They picked nine members as a part of the fraternity. And those nine members stayed. Guess what? One of those nine members is in that 11 person mug shot. So you think that you're weeding out the bad when you come down and you self-select, right? But you're mm -hmm. not. You're still leaving that that toxic culture to then manifest into the next group of kids, you know, and it doesn't help that you also have an alumni that is supporting the chapter who is a former member. Right. Former alumni knows the culture of it. Um, if you want change, you have to stop doing what has historically been done. And instead of doing that, they just let this cycle keep going. I mean, this fraternity had so much in, if you, so something I found out as I was like doing my dissertation, I did some research on different websites, but particularly the Delta Chi website. And I found a list of hazing incidents. So they have a hazing incident report. And I was able to find, and this is broad day, like the police could have found this. Anybody could have found this, right? But it's a, a hazing incident report, sexual assault report. It's got all these cases across the United States from this one single fraternity, right? When you look at it, you can easily see that they were down at VCU investigating the VCU chapter on a report of hazing four months before Adam died. They found it unsubstantiated and he's dead four months later. So, the, the other thing too, that I want them to know about is what happened after he passed with the fraternity itself? Like what happened to the actual fraternity? They, they were expelled, but they called for help. And when they called to get help, they were basically told to go ghost, take the letters off, you're not a part of this anymore, this fraternity anymore, go ghost. And then the, the university did their own investigation. The police did their own investigation and they decided to expel them. This is months later. It's not like a, you know, it's not a, a quick process at all. He died in February. We heard from the Dean of Students in June that they were expelling this fraternity from campus. So even though they 
expelled the fraternity from campus and the boys that were charged were later expelled from VCU, you still leave behind the brothers that weren't charged. So then what do those brothers go and do? They go into the other fraternities on campus, right? And then they join those fraternities and the hazing that was once in just Delta Chi is now expanding on to other organizations on the same campus. And it's, and it's my understanding too, that when, when I guess the president of Preetness, president of the fraternity called national, national basically said, take the letters off the house, lose my number. You're not part of this. We're not associated. So, and the reason that I want to point that out, because it just seems to be a common theme with this fraternity is to just like, Hey, this is shit's going to happen. It's bad. And we're just going to not talk to you anymore about it. We're not going to acknowledge it. We're not going to do anything. They did it with Adam. They did it with Riley and they did it, you know, to the actual fraternity after this happened, it's zero accountability for them. The other thing that I learned through this, because Dan has become a wealth of knowledge and, and Dan has me all fired up about this and, and meeting, you know, Eric and Courtney has, has also helped fuel my fire for, for this to, um, you know, it's, Fraternities have insurance for this, but they also self-insure. And so when events like this happen, what they're doing is they're paying the max on the policy, the policy that they've written that they're self-insuring. And so it's not costing them anything additional when somebody gets injured or somebody dies. It's not costing them anything additional to do this. And there's no change in the way the insurances are. So they're just like, okay, we're going to pay the max liability and we move on and it happens again. It continues to happen and they just, they just don't talk about it. They don't talk about everything that's going on and it's just, it's not okay. This is, this is brotherhood. You're supposed to sign up and it, they're supposed to be your brothers. And if they've accepted you, in my opinion, as a pledge, then you're, you're a little brother, but you're, you might not be fully initiated, but you're still a little brother. You know, they've chosen you to come part of this. They're supposed to look out for you. That's the whole purpose of it. And I think I told you, Eric, and it, it's really weird because watching this and having talked to you, you kind of triggered a memory for me. Um, so I was in a fraternity. I was in Ta Kappa Epsilon Teak. And um, I wasn't in it the whole time in college because I felt like the, it was, the brotherhood part was a lie. And I felt that probably within my first year, year and a half of it. And, and so I left. But I was thinking about when I pledged and this whole thing with the alcohol my fraternity did the same thing. Now, I never had to drink anything near like what they gave Adam or what they gave these other guys, but they gave us this big cup and we had to go around and that you could share it with your pledge brothers. You could share it with your big, you could share it with anybody that was willing to, to do it. So you wouldn't get in this position. And I'm pretty sure that was what was supposed to be happening with Adam. But the way I understand is they didn't, they singled him out. They stood over him and said, you're going to drink 100% of this by yourself with no help. And, and I was thinking about it and I was like, holy crap, I did the same exact thing. I mean, obviously not to the same level. And I had totally forgotten about that. So uh, my point is, is that it's not just this fraternity. It's other fraternities too. I and mean, my fraternity was in Georgia, not anywhere near Virginia, not anywhere near Mizzou. Mm -hmm. And mine was 20 years ago, though, not to date myself, but, you know, 20 years ago. I get it. Like, that's exactly the same for me. So I, I was in a sorority 20 years ago and you're right. It, it brings up a lot, but it also eats at me that I didn't know he was pledging before the night he died. Like just to give him a heads up, just to say, here's what you might face. Like I did the same thing. Mine was mad dog 2020. They hand you a bottle, say it's your, you know, right. Like this is your family drink, drink up. I did it. You do it kind of thing. And that's exactly, yeah. I mean, it was, it's still the tradition 20 years later, even though we know that the past 13 deaths from hazing have been on big brother night, 13. It's just, it's one of the most deadliest nights in fraternal history and we're doing nothing about it. So even when we tell them get, we're getting rid of it, or we, even when they say they're getting rid of it, they just make up a new name for it. It's like when, when they say they're getting rid of the pledge process and they call it the new associates members, it's still pledging. It's still pledging with just this brand new name. What, what it's the same thing. Like I just, it's beyond frustrating. Here's my thing. 
if you have to pledge to get into a fraternity or sorority or whatever, that's ridiculous. It should be like a job interview. You meet the people, they talk to you, you like them, they like you, you're in, you know, it's, it's cut and dry. You don't have to go through four weeks of abuse. And uh, I mean, and the girls are, and, um, they may not be as dangerous with the alcohol, but they body shame. Um, they make them do, they make them flash, you know, uh, fraternity guys. Uh, there's, there's a whole list of stuff that they do. And it's just, it's horrible the way people are treating each other nowadays. It is because you're, these are supposed to be people that you're signing up for brotherhood or sisterhood. And I mean, mm -hmm. and I think for women, it, it's kind of the same thing, you know, with guys, you know, even throughout like, you know, your K through 12 years, you, you, the bullying tends to be more physical and just girls are brutal. They, they just really are, especially to other ones. It's other women. It's just, they're terrible. It's so, yeah, it's, it's a different type of, it's more mental what they do than you yeah. know, giving somebody a handle of alcohol and saying, and it's, it's not okay. No. Um, Humiliation. It's the mental, yeah. you know, with, with sororities. Yeah. So well, before we go, watch ahead. The, no, go ahead, jump ahead. No, I was just going to say the next part of the video is the investigation part. So that'll answer a lot of questions about, um, you know, that side of it. But what I want to let everybody know is Lynn and I, our whole family just got floored. We were, I mean, we couldn't even put a sentence together. We, we, we didn't understand what had happened. We don't, you know, Courtney came along and was like, who's talking to them? Who's investigating? What's going on? There were so many things that the Richmond police do, but Courtney you know, went out and started talking to the pledges. She interviewed all the pledges before because the pledges don't have any allegiance to the fraternity. This is really important because they'll tell exactly what was going on because they were actually hazed that night too. They didn't realize it, but once, you know, it was pointed out to them, they all understood and they admitted that they were as well. But um, by Courtney um, interviewing all the pledges, she, they all were aligned in what happened. So, you know, you kind of know what's going on and you can start putting pieces together of what happened that night and never, nothing will ever make sense of what happened, but with, with, you know, by her being able to piece it together, um, at least we had an, kind of an understanding. Um, so, I mean, a lot of her notes were turned over to the police too. So that's really important. Um, you know, they had something to go by and, and knew, you know, who to talk. Um, but I mean, with, without her doing that, um, I, I mean, I don't even know where we would have been. Um, I don't even know if we would have gotten the 11 indictments. Um, I, I mean, and we immediately turned to, 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 we told our local, you know, affiliates, ABC, CBS, Fox, NBC, and, and, you know, by Monday morning, it was on the Today Show and it was on Good Morning America and they were doing interviews. So just to try and get the word out because we were afraid nobody was investigating and nothing was happening. Um, it, it Not only did you lose your only child, you think nobody's taking it seriously. And, you know, then and they're telling us too, It's remember, it's in the height of COVID, we're like grabbing our jackets and our car keys to get down to Richmond to, to, to see, because I didn't, there was some part of me that didn't believe it was my son because it didn't sound like my son and what happened to him didn't sound like my son. So by they're saying, no, you can't get into um, the mayor's office. You know, you're not, it's not okay for you to drive in the condition you're in. And, you know, so I just wanted to, the, your audience to know that, I mean, without her, I don't know where we'd be. I mean, I'm so grateful for her. I love her so much, and um, she's incredible. I also want to say for, for people, and I don't mean to, you can tell me if I'm overstepping with this one, but a lot of times um, families want answers, and sometimes that's even more important than the justice. And I, I think a really great recent example of that 
is Beth Holloway with her daughter, Natalie Holloway. She didn't, mm -hmm. Jorn Vandersloot was flown here. All she wanted was answers. She, he didn't get any additional jail time. He was told he's not allowed to come back to the United States. You know, his, his, his sentence gets to run concurrently with what he's doing with Peru. Um, Joe Petito, Nicole, you know, Nicole Schmidt, Guy Petito's parents, they wanted answers. You know, they, they were in depositions with the laundries. They had to face these people because they wanted answers and that was more important to them than anything else. And what was trying to happen here with these fraternities, when they clam up the way that they do, it deprives parents of answers. And it's all to protect this, this thing, this just, you know, this fake made up brotherhood. And, and that's what it is. And, and, and I mean, it is. I, I experienced it. I didn't think that it was a real brotherhood. Do I have friends from those days that I'm still friends with? Absolutely. But I haven't heard from most of those guys in 20 years since I left. Um, I think that that's true for, for a lot of them. And they basically had to force these guys to give them answers. They tried to not give them anything. And if it wasn't for the pledges, if it wasn't for Courtney, they probably still wouldn't have answers. So the fact that you did that, Courtney, is amazing. But before we go into the next part that shows the investigation, any anything else you want to do before we lead in? Now, there's 11 indicted, six, six pled guilty. The other five cooperated or said that they would testify. Um, so I'm just trying to answer some of the questions I see that pop up. Um, the, oh, I yeah, am too, Eric. Yeah, VCU. Um, yeah, they've been expelled forever from Delta Chi has been expelled forever from VCU. Um, a lot of times, which is quite dangerous, is these fraternities um, they they form um, offsite um, aliases of the 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 fraternity, and they're not on campus, and so they come back and they have no oversight by the schools, and they have no oversight by a national. So they're really like somebody else was saying in here, they're gangs. I mean, they're just, they're gangs. And, you know, part of my thing is, is, you know, this is like a white privilege crime. Um, all, all, most of the kids that are commending them are, are white and they're getting off of these, these crimes um, by blaming the victim, by, um, you know, saying we didn't do it, he did it, you know, to himself or whatever. And it's not the case at all. Well, we'll go ahead and play the next part of it and uh, let people see. The only thing that they told me was that your son has passed and alcohol was a factor and we don't detect any foul play at this time. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? I'm Allison Martin. I was the prosecutor who handled the, um, the case involving Adam Oaks. The fraternity, the local ritual was that you chugged that first family drink with your big brother. Adam's turn comes comes up he's matched with Andrew White. Andrew White importantly hands him a handle of whiskey and the reason that's important is because we've got a handle which is bigger than the bottles that everyone else is getting and because it's dark alcohol that's a killer. His alcohol level at the time of death was probably in excess of a 0. 0.40. He didn't have a chance. He might have had a chance if someone had realized hours earlier 
there were three or possibly four 911 calls for noise disturbance, and the police never responded. At any point, had they knocked on the door and asked them to stop, you know, or if they'd come inside, they would have seen Adam needing help and, and would have immediately called an ambulance and got him help. And he'd still be alive today. You know, as soon as I hung up, it seriously felt like a nightmare. It seriously felt like it wasn't real. And um, it felt like any moment I was just going to wake back up again and everything would be fine. And kind of crippling anxiety that it felt like a weight, uh, an anchor was on top of my chest. I was shocked, confused, like went into a panic attack. My roommate just knocks on my condo door and says, hey, dude, like the cops are here. My mom's calling me and she's hysterical. She's crying. And uh, she said police came to the house and that they surrounded the house and uh, that they said I needed to go to jail. So, you know, I put some shoes on. I walk over there and they ask me if I'm Jason. I say yes. And they told me to step outside and immediately throw cuffs on me. And they basically like set it up to pick all of us up at the same time. I don't even know what to think. It was just, it was huge shock for me. So at first I have no idea why they're in there. And then I'm like, officer, like, like what, what is, what is, why am I being arrested? And then he finally was like hazing misdemeanor, like use your imagination. I wanted to be in law enforcement. I even thought about being a police officer and just seeing them handcuff me and throw me into a van. It was, um, I mean, to use the word terrifying is an understatement. When I got to the jail, usually, you know, when you get misdemeanor charges, you, you can post bail if it's something light. Um, but I was denied bond. Because we were denied bond, we couldn't see the judge. So we ended up staying Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and most of Monday. It was just awful. I mean, you're, I was locked in a cell that only had a bed and a toilet. I remember just laying there in bed in an orange jumpsuit thinking, this is really happening. I called my parents and then I walked into the courtroom Monday morning and my parents saw me wearing a jumpsuit. The minute I got the opportunity to get a phone call, I called my mom. It was hard to explain what was going on. Um, I felt like I let my parents down. I felt like a disappointment. I felt like uh, like I'm just like a, a f up. It was a total nightmare. I wasn't scared. I knew it was coming. Um, in a way, I felt like I deserved it. You know, I walked straight into court, pled guilty to both charges because there's just there was no other alternative. You know, I was guilty. I provided him the bottle. You know, I hazed him by having him drink it. And to put the family through some sort of trial is just unfathomable to me to relive that. Um, so it just, it was, it was something that I had to do. I had to look them in the eye and tell them, I'm sorry that I couldn't have, I probably didn't do anything. I'm sorry that, you know, I, I was there, I was the president and I didn't do anything about it. To any kid who's watching this, this really could be you. Like, this could have been me. This could be your best friend. Um, this could be some guy in your class who you don't even know that well, but this, this could be anybody. No one's safe from the dangers of, of excessive drinking and of hazing. You see a lot of incidents about hazing where it's like, you know, a guy is, you know, falls over, hits his head, or, or he's barfing all night, or something, you know, something rather obvious, and your skin's blue in the face, you know? But with Adam, you know, I, I just didn't notice any of that. And so I think it's important for people to know that it, you know, sometimes, like, it, it'll seem like it's fine. Like, you'll see someone just sleeping, you know? But then they don't wake up. Whenever I see his picture, you know, especially the one where he's smiling and stuff, uh, 
I think about his parents, I think about his family, and I think about all the pain that I've caused them and how there's nothing I could do. I was excited to be with him in a fraternity and grow with him, and I think we would have been close friends for a very long time. This is a way to turn something absolutely horrible and tragic into something positive and something that we can actually build on and prevent from ever happening again. Every time they get down, that's what I have to remind them of, is like, even when we're long gone, Adam's law will still be here. So he'll still be here. And then they kind of perk up a little bit, because it's true. There'll always be a law that's in his name that makes a difference for kids. Something could happen. It could be a stupid Facebook memory that pops up. And I don't know what's wrong. What, what, what happened, you know, Linda's there crying, you know, uncontrollably for hours. It's horrible going to bed at night, crying yourself to sleep, you know, just wanting to hold your child one more time and not being able to. bill championed as Adams Law is moving forward in the General Assembly. It's one of two anti-hazing bills honoring VCU freshman Adam Oaks. The version of the bill that passed requires that schools publicly post founded instances of hazing online. Another bill would give immunity to bystanders who ask for help when hazing is happening. It also toughens the criminal charge if a victim is seriously injured or dies from a misdemeanor to a felony, which can carry a 10-year sentence. We want to make real change so that no other kid goes through what Adam went through that night. Governor Glenn Youngkin signs an anti-hazing bill into law in honor of VCU freshman Adam Oates. It's just showing that all the hard work and all the steps that we've taken since Adam's passing are coming to fruition. Through this law, Eric Oakes sees his son's legacy living on. I mean, Adam looked after other people. He's doing it again today, you know, trying to help others and make sure that they, you know, have a safe experience. I think it was a pretty powerful video. Um, I think Dan did a great job. And yeah, exactly. Claps. Um, do here's a question for you. Um, it seems like the only person that was that maybe had remorse was the president. Is that correct? Is he still working with y'all? Yeah, we gave him credit at the end of the film 
by noting it, I know it was pretty quick, um, but he is going to um, speaking engagements with us, the Love Like Adam Foundation, even though he's not court appointed anymore to go, he has gone to a, a, some after that. Well, he wants he's to help, so that's it. He, absolutely, that's exactly what he says, and he seems remorseful. Um, the question that people are asking, I've seen it a few times, I'm going to pop it up on the screen there. How can they get a pass? What can they do to help? What can they help do to get this law that y'all are doing outside of Virginia? Well, I guess it didn't technically, I guess it didn't overall pass because they quashed it, right? Squashed it. But um, what can, what can people do? You're on mute, Courtney. So one, one of the things is that, so sounds awful. It takes someone dying to get a law passed in states. So it's Adam's law for Virginia, but it's Tim's law in New Jersey. It's Andrew's law in Florida. It's um, Matthew's law in California. It's it's Colin's law in Ohio. It's um, there's all these laws in all these states named after a kid that had to die in order for it to become a law. And that is so sad. Um, I would advocate and advocate and advocate to get this law passed before a death happens as much as possible. Um, we created Adam's law based on four things Adam didn't have that night. One was the proper hazing education. Adam was left off of the, the only hazing education that VCU offered. He was left off of the email, so he never got a hazing education. So part of Adam's law requires hazing prevention education for all kids. Another part of Adam's law is bystander immunity. 40 kids walked over my cousin's lifeless body and partied over him. We want to encourage young people to call 911. In a situation like that, if you call 911, you're now provided immunity from getting charged with hazing if you call 911. Because we know that if any one of them had called for Adam, he would still be here with us today. The third piece is the transparency, the hazing incident report. If Adam had known all of the things that this fraternity had done in its history, he never would have joined them. But he didn't know because at that point, everything's behind closed doors and file cabinets. You can't see the history of organizations on campuses. When we passed Adam's Law now, every school in the state of Virginia has to have a hazing incident report on all of their websites that parents and kids can go to and they can read how many incidents of hazing each organization has had. And then the last piece is, unless we continue to create reforms against hazing, we aren't going to make any progress. So the last part is all of the schools in Virginia must send their hazing incidents to the Piazza Center that does research um, on hazing and hazing prevention. So we really advocated for those parts because those are the four things he didn't have when he died. But then we realized as I was doing my dissertation, that it wasn't enough. A lot of kids are hazed before they even get to college. 1.5 million high school students are hazed every single year, 1.5. So this year we went to the General Assembly and we advocated for a high school hazing prevention bill and we passed it. So now all ninth or 10th grade students in the state of Virginia will receive a research-based hazing prevention instruction in ninth grade or 10th grade health and phys ed. So now we've passed two bills. The felony did not pass, it, it passed the House 100 we were entirely in favor of it. It was the Senate that stopped it because they had some older um, legislators that truly believed that hazing made them the men that they are today. And then and we actually had one of them say that. He literally rubbed my back and said, hazing belongs in the military. And it was just a disgusting moment. There was also another senator who was like, we need to keep people out of jail, not put stronger laws on the books. And where's the research to show that that uh, stricter laws deter poor behavior? I sent him the research and never heard from him again. So 
it's getting to those politicians that you can to say, okay, we need change in this state before this happens to one of our kids. So any of the states that don't have those have a hazing law, that's where we need to start. Like Montana is one state, they have no hazing legislation whatsoever. So you can haze and not be charged in the state of Montana. So I think there's about at this point, 12, is it 12? I think states have no laws at all. And then there's some states that have education laws, but don't have a penalty law. So it's really trying to figure out who doesn't have them and advocating for those bills. And, and that means going to your local legislator and saying, and if anybody needs it, we have a, we have Adam's law as one that you can show as an example, one that you can use, one that you get can get passed in another state. Um, I'm happy to walk through every step that we took to get this bill passed. Um, the hazing high school bill, we worked with all these education associations, school board associations, um, and every single one of them backed up this bill. So um, the health and safety of our kids is so important. And I think that legislators are starting to see just how much hazing is happening all around us. Um, the 40, out of the 43 deaths that have just occurred, 32 of them were all freshmen. So they're getting these kids as soon as they hit campus where they're inexperienced, they're 18, 19 years old, and they don't know any better. So the more we can get them before they step on campus, the better. So hazing, high school hazing laws and um, higher ed are just so important to being proactive to keep our kids safe. So what she's talking about too is it's just not your national, you know, representatives, but your local ones, your state representatives, ones that are local to you, they're very easy to find typically because, yeah. you know, they're not going for the entire state, you know, or they're a bigger district. They're usually pretty approachable too. And, and that's, that's where you need to start with this. Yes. And, um, you know, it's one of these things too, that when you get enough states on board, you yes. know, doing the same thing, then you can take it to a federal yeah. level and pass it that. And, um, and like, I know I've talked to you about this, Eric, and that's something that the Petito family is, is trying to do in regard to domestic violence. And so far they've gotten, um, it's not named after Gabby, but basically they've gotten, uh, you know, laws passed changing the way that states and police handle domestic violence. And I think three states now, at least two, uh, maybe three though. That's um, great. one of which is Florida as a matter of fact, which is, you know, a, a very large state. So, uh, you know, again, I think that that's somebody I, I really want to put you in contact with and, and have you chat with him because I think that you two are very, I think that you two will connect really well. Um, and I think that y'all can help each other out with this kind of stuff. So, uh, but that's you. basically what you have to do. I mean, that's, that's what you have to do. You have to yeah. reach out and, um, this is my saying, <laughs> It's making small but mighty changes, right? You start with just your legislative state. You push for it, right? You go like the full throttle and get this passed. And the more organizations you can get to support the bill passing, the better off you are. Like the better off that bill has to survive. And then a lot of what our legislators do, we had two companion bills. We had one in the Senate and one in the House. If it didn't pass the House, it was going to get through the Senate and vice versa. So there's things that you can do that would that can help. Um, is there a packet that we can get to start legislation? Yes, absolutely. So that, we haven't gotten to that part, but um, if you email me, Courtney at lovelikeadam.com, I'm happy to send you um, Adam's Law so that I can show you all of the various pieces of it. Um, another piece that we haven't gotten to yet is that um, when Adam died, we created the Love Like Adam Foundation. It was very weird. We were literally at the CPA's office. We just got... Uh, we just gotten there to sign papers to start the Love Like Adam Foundation when the medical examiner called and told us that Adam had died from alcohol poisoning and that his BAC was 0 0.419. And then we went in and signed papers to start this organization in support of, you know, carrying on his legacy and honoring him. So our foundation actually 
goes around and we present to high schools and higher ed institutions all across Virginia, but we've now expanded nationally. So we were just uh, at University of South Carolina and University of Tennessee um, and all a, a ton of universities in Virginia, but we also do um, different stakeholders. So police, we're now educating police on how to investigate hazing cases. We're doing prosecutors conferences as well. Um, we're even going to college campuses and then teaching the college campus police how to investigate hazing cases. So what I, I'm saying all this is to say that we've actually built a curriculum for high school students. That's a three-day curriculum that we will be sharing on our website for people to use. We've also created a curriculum for police. Um, we've also created a curriculum for higher ed institutions. Um, and then also prosecutors. So we have one for the various audi audiences that target um, them in particular to make them um, raise awareness on hazing, how to investigate hazing, um, what to look for, all of those things, the impact that hazing has, how to, uh, you know, signs that your, your child is being hazed. Um, we even have a parent presentation that we actually do for local PTAs, too. So I'd be happy to share any of that with you if you email me at Courtney at lovelikeadam.com. There you go, guys. What would you like to say, Mr. Oaks? Yeah, so <clears throat> I don't know, maybe about six months ago, um, uh, our state senator, Jennifer Boisco, who uh, was the champion of Adam's Law, um, knew how passionate we were to get the felony law changed, but we also wanted to um, pursue a high school bill uh, to make it a standard of learning in the state of Virginia that hazing prevention education would be taught in the ninth or 10th grade level. It successfully passed and the governor signed the bill last week. So now students in the state of Virginia high school students, ninth or 10th grade, will get as part of the standard of learning hazing prevention training. So we're now going before the colleges. So, because my opinion at college, it's great to have the education, but it's kind of too late. We need to educate them younger. And Courtney was incredible going around meeting with all the different state senators, the, the state uh, representatives to make sure it passed the House and the Senate, answered any questions. She continued to go down to Richmond. It's about a two hour grueling drive down 95 and heavy traffic, um, testifying live in front of committees, answering their questions, um, getting all of the big, what I call stakeholders like, VDOE, Virginia Department of Education, um, Education, Virginia Education Association, um, Fairfax County Schools, Loudoun County Schools, all of them to testify on behalf of this training, this, this you know, hazing prevention education is, is really long overdue. And um, I mean, I saw somebody in here say she's superwoman. She's incredible family of four, full-time job, president of the, the foundation, getting laws passed, doing investigative work. I mean, I don't know when she has time to sleep or do anything else. I mean, just phenomenal. I mean, Linda and I would be, I mean, right now, Linda's, Linda's lost, you know? I mean, she barely leaves the house. She misses her, her boy. They were so tight. I mean, a, a bond between a mother and a son, it, it's just unbreakable. And uh, she's, in, she's in a major, major depressed state and can't pull out of it. It's hard. Yeah, I can't even, I, I can't even imagine anything that doesn't help. Um, but I will say, yeah, Courtney, what you're doing is incredibly impressive. To have all the, I mean, do you sleep? <laughs> um, no, not really. That's okay. But, um, you know, I wasn't the person that I am now when Adam died. I 
I think I saw my family breaking and it was like, I either break two or I become that backbone, right? And I chose to become the backbone. I entirely switched my dissertation all around um, to do hazing prevention work so that I could help other kids not go through what Adam went through. I saw my aunt and my uncle hurting. And so I went with them to the funeral home. I did his obituary. You know what I mean? Like you just, you just do it. It's like, you know that you have to be strong and you have to keep going. And I mean, it was, it was for him. Everything that we've done since his passing was for him and to keep his memory alive. Um, we give scholarships to seniors, four, five scholarships out to high school seniors in Adam's honor every year and seeing the kids' faces and, you know, um, the excitement that they get that they've won the scholarship in his name. And we, we don't do the scholarships like the straight A student. We do the kid that has a big heart like Adam had. So we have them write like a short essay on the good that they're doing for the world. So what have you, what kindness have you shown? What have you done for others? You know, things like that, that made Adam shine and made him the person that he was. That's what we look for in the scholarship recipient. So, um, I think I, I just have become a fighter because that's what Adam needed. He needed somebody to fight for him and to get his story out there and to not let another hazing incident or hazing death get swept under the rug. And I just couldn't let that happen to my cousin. Well, I, I think it's amazing what y'all are doing. And it's, it's crazy to me to think that the same things that fraternities were doing 20 years ago when I was in it, I'm sure it's probably the same thing they were doing you know, I, did, I know that Dan was in a, Daniel was in a fraternity too. So I'm, it's the same thing that they were doing 30 years ago. Brotherhood might have meant a little bit more back then, maybe for him. Um, for me, I didn't really find it to be, but um, it's too the world. It's it's barbaric and it's archaic. Mm. This type of behavior, mm. there's there's literally no point to it. It's bullying, and in, in Adam's case specifically, it was definitely bullying. Giving him more because he was bigger. That's it's, it's just messed up. And I know that y'all know that, but so, I'm just driving the point home. No, I agree. And I think what we did not, what we really didn't, I can already tell, like, you know, I'm reading through the comments and the questions and stuff, but I do feel like it's important to also say this last piece. And that is that, so you see the video, you you see their emotion, right? Like they they talk well about Adam. They, you know, he's always smiling. He seemed like such a great guy, yada, yada, right? Like you see that in the video, but let me tell you that afterward, we got access to the group text messages and that's what they do is they, they text message either Snapchat or group me, or um, there's all these other apps that they do things for. And in Adam's case, they, they just used text message, group text message messages, but they had it him targeted two weeks before this happened. They knew they were calling him the obese kid. They targeted him for his size. The night that he's laying there dying on the ground, this one kid is calling him a pig roast. The pig roast came early. Another kid says he's dead on the ground right now. And a kid does the laughing emoji. So, you see these kids in this video one way. And then when you see these text messages, they're sending behind the scenes, right? Hid behind these computer apps and whatever else. It shows you a completely new picture of them. It's like Jekyll and Hyde. Like it literally is. You see these kids on the video showing remorse and, and, and acting pretty for the camera. And then you see these horrendous text messages that are just like, I don't know how anyone could ever say some of the things that they were saying in it and think that it was okay. Like it, it just, it baffled me. They talked about dumping the pledges wherever they felt like it. Like, where are we going to dump the pledges? So like all these things were planned, right? They were all planned. They were all very, um, 
it's almost systematic, right? Like they'd done it so much in so many years that they knew what to do. They knew how much to buy. They knew how many milliliters to buy. It was just insane. And then to target him, the beautiful soul that he is because of his size, because of his like what they considered his weakness or, or whatever, that's what hazing does. That's what they do is they target who they think is going to be the weakest. It's not just in Adam's case either. I mean, if you look at Max Gruber's case, they did the same thing. Michael Dang, all these kids, they target the weakest, who they think is going to be the weakest person, who they will end up breaking. And they, they assumed it would be Adam and Adam didn't just didn't survive. His body couldn't take the amount of alcohol they were giving him. Nobody could survive that. No one could survive. No. It's it's a it's an obscene amount of alcohol. And and to be to be honest, we're their true colors are the what they're saying in this text messages, you know. The, what that's their true colors, not you know we see on i mean dan did an incredible job just making them likable you know to a degree you know just so you can sit through the film but um yeah their true colors are, are what they're saying to their buddies and their friends and um just despicable the worst part is is that some of the boys that were in those text messages had their charges dropped they were the ones, the worst ones that targeted him had their charges dropped. And that's such, it's just incredibly frustrating because here you have someone saying these awful things and, and liking, po I, I just, it's so hard for me to understand how they got away with zero charges, nothing, not a single piece of accountability. And why is that? So another piece through their sides of the stories and stuff, you've got all these various stories. Oh, we gave Adam a pillow. We gave him a blanket. Um, a, another kid said we backpacked him. Do you know what backpacking is, Justin? I don't. Okay, it's when they put a backpack on a kid that's sleeping on his back so that he can't roll over and choke on his own vomit. So it's like a safety maneuver that they do for kids. We've got some of them saying they backpacked at them. Some of them saying they didn't. Some of them saying they all signed their bottles. Some of them saying they didn't. The police walk in there and collect zero evidence. If you saw the body cam footage, there's empty bottles across um, across the, the table. There's empty bottles across, like right on top of the fireplace. There, There's empty bottles everywhere and not a single one was collected. Andrew put the bottle beside Adam's head as a trophy. His empty bottle beside his head as a trophy. No one collected that. Like it's just I don't know. It, it's so incredibly frustrating to think that you have all these signs and all these things saying this is a hazing case but yet you're not treating it as a hazing as a hazing case. And if it's that you haven't ever investigated, then you treat any scene you go on as an investigation, right? You like that I'm I'm investigating a murder or I'm investigating, you know, a crime here. And they just didn't do that. So then by the time they wanted to come back and collect any evidence, where was the evidence? Long gone. Oh, way, way, way long gone. I mean, we wouldn't it's, have known about the pulse checker and the risk, like none of that, if it hadn't been for interviewing the pledges and the text messages. And that night, the, the night that we were informed, it was probably about 10 o'clock. We hadn't heard from the police from Richmond at all. And I said, Courtney, we need to call them. So I called them and they thought VCU was investigating the crime. So nobody had been doing anything because VCU, we called them and they said, no, it's the city of Richmond. They're, they're the ones that are responsible for it. So you, everybody knows in the first 48 hours, that's, that's first 24 in this case, because all the evidence is getting thrown out or, and then they didn't treat it like a crime scene. You saw the, the body cam footage at the beginning. There were 
10 mm-hmm. to 15 people walking through, you know, that, that, that house and um, police officers were outside making guesses on what happened to him, you know, and, and there's ears and there's video all around. Um, when they in- interviewed the boys, you know, from the house, um, you know, they, they did it in the room full of other people and several of them were there so they could hear what the one boy was saying. You need to haul them down to the precinct. You need to investigate each one, interview each one separately in separate rooms. You know, you need to get all their uh, phones, all their devices. You need to go and find out every name of every person that was there that night. You're going to need to haul them down. You need to invest. You need. It wasn't treated like a crime. Adam was a sweet soul. When he walked into a room, you were honestly happy to see him. And I, Linda and I thought it was just us and our family. But all his friends would sit there and tell you the same thing. You know, he'd, he'd walk into a room and immediately greet you with a smile. That was his disposition. He could have been having an awful day. You know, I mean, just awful. And he would still reach you with a smile and treat you nicely. You know, um, and he didn't deserve this. So at this point, we're just trying to tell Adam's story to anybody that'll listen to try and prevent it from happening to somebody else's kid, you know, and God forbid it be somebody important, you know, a lawmaker, if their grandkids or their children, then you'll see action happen. But until then, on the federal level, we need to focus on the states because the states are getting it done. Exactly. Yeah, the states are getting it done. The states are passing it. But on top of what Eric's saying too is that you're basically in fraternities. It's a hierarchy too, right? I mean, there is the national, but above the national, a lot of the national organizations belong to the North American Interfraternal Council as part of their oversight. So the NIC is overseeing the national organizations that choose to be under it, pay the money to be under it. Then you've got the local chapters underneath of those. And the local chapters are run by 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids. And the local chapters are responsible for their members, but also disciplinary actions against their members the culture of their organizations. They're given all these adult responsibilities when they aren't fully developed to make those decisions to ensure the safety and and the health of all of their members. We're telling them to have a risk management chair, not a risk prevention chair. So we're basically saying, we know something's going to happen, now manage it instead of preventing it from happening in the first place. And I think that's a lot of responsibility to put on on young kids when it's their first time away from home, their first chance at independence. And you're saying take on all these adult responsibilities for yourself, but then also for the other 150 kids in your fraternity. Um, I just think that's way too much to put on people. I think there needs to be more oversight, more intervention, more reform. Um, to advisors, advisors that are not alumni of that organization in particular. Um, I think that might help some things. There's some things that we can do to change and make the culture different, but we have to be willing to make the changes to do that. And I just don't know that there are very many organizations willing to do that. I see a lot of people, and I know I can obviously see you commenting in the chat, Eric. Um, a lot of people are wanting to do something for Linda. We're also streaming on on TikTok as well, so they can't see the chat that we have here on YouTube. Um, so if they want to hop over, they can see it. But where people want to do things with Mother's Day coming up for Linda, I know that she's broken. I'm sure it's it's got to be. There are certain days of the year that I'm sure are incredibly tough for her. I would imagine that's one of them. Um where can people send okay dan just put i'm going to put this address up on the screen here for people who want to oh, see yeah. it they can screenshot it um yeah. you know Everybody's if anybody so wants sweet. to send anything uh i will i will always argue with anybody that as far as as 
social media followers go. I have truly the best ones. Like we've done a lot of things together to help a lot of people do a lot of some things that weren't necessarily helpful, but just um, needed to be done, like flying aerial banners around people's houses, for example. Um, but we just, they're, they're very generous people. So they want to do that. Now, the other thing too is, is the foundation is at lovelikeadam.org. If people want to donate. Lovelikeadam.com. Dot com. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Courtney has some reason she did dot, dot com instead of dot org. Well, you guys can go donate there if you want. Um, yeah. and I would encourage you to do so. It's obviously a very good, you know, uh, foundation good cause and it's one of those things in my opinion like again having been in a fraternity until i'm just very glad i met daniel because i didn't know about any of this he was he was here for riley i was already frustrated with the the way that the fraternity was acting towards riley and then he starts sharing your story and i'm like oh my god i had no idea how deep this truly went and um now i'm definitely on you know i'm definitely in y'all's corner for sure um and I think it's important that people know your story because I don't think I don't think most of us think about this. You know, we 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 earn a fraternity in college and we get out of, or a sorority, and you know, for those of us who are, and we just don't think about it ever again. Yeah, I mean, Adam's you story know? is much like many others that have have passed, is the most tragic of all stories. But there's tens of thousands that happen every year that people don't know about. You know, and that's the mental, um, you know, toll that it takes on somebody, the emotional toll, the physical, you know, the, and people carry that with them. They don't tell their parents and they don't, you know, they, especially guys, they keep it bottled up and then one day they snap and that's not cool. So for me, if you're, if you, if you have children that are going to college, I mean, obviously be in their business. We were in at <laughs> you know, if he were here, he would tell you that. And we were we were always communicating well with him. Um, and, you know, ha if they want to join a fraternity or sorority, have them ask around campus and, you know, do some research yourself. Uh, find out, you know, which fraternity it is. And, you know, uh, some of them have bad track records. So, you know, make sure that it's not one of them is my advice. And, uh, do your research, and when you're done researching, do more, you know, and uh, educate yourself on it. And I, we know Greek life isn't going away, so we're going to have to deal with it. And the best way I know how to deal with it is to educate and to try and make people aware of what's going on, you know, um, tools that they can take with them, how to get themselves, how to identify situations and then know what to do to get somebody help you know th those are those are key things and i'm sharing this up here too for a reason because i know dan dan is happily putting their address up here and their phone number for anybody who wants to call um but it's but it's frustrating to me and i and i know y'all don't want to look at these people so you don't have to but i emailed this i emailed carl and invited him to come on just to have a discussion about what can we do to change the way you've had two incidents where your brothers have clammed up that, you know, that I'm aware of. I'm quite sure there's more. What can we do? And he it's met with silence. Okay. It's met with silence and they're not doing anything about it. And, you know, sometimes the way to start, you know, making people affect change is to just bombard them, <laughs> you know, Tell them what you think. You know, you guys have now heard Adam's story. You saw what they did with Riley Strain. These are two fairly re Riley's incredibly recent. So you can go to this website and you can you can reach out to him or anybody on there. You know, you can click this for his email. You have all these people here that y'all can just bombard if you want. So that's all I'm saying with that. What else before we before we wrap up? Um, what else would you guys like to share? If anything, it's been a lot. I know. Trying to think. I mean, you know the the foundation. I'm so what a lot of people, um, 
if you make donations, the money's going to uh, the scholarships. So, you know, we, we can direct your money directly to the scholarships. Um, and yeah, like Courtney was saying earlier, it's just about being a good person, you know, so you don't have to have 4.5 GPA, you know, um, that, that doesn't hurt, but um, just, you know, being a good person and tell us, you know, what traits of Adams do you possess? And, you know, just write a little essay about what you've done to help someone else. And um, yeah, we're, we're just trying to get the message out. And um, Dan's video, uh, Death of a Pledge, That Amok Story is available. So, I mean, any high school in America, you know, can show it if there's um, government teachers or anyone that wants to show it in their class, it's up there and they can show it. I mean, I think every senior should see it before they go to college and make decision if they want to join a fraternity, you know? I mean, frankly, it should be emailed to parents mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, outside of just that, it should be emailed to parents. You know, I, I think that that could be very compelling for those who are, you know, who are in school or have kids. I mean, not everybody's going to watch it, but if you save one, I mean, there's a lot of people tonight mm -hmm. in this chat that are like, my kid's getting ready to school. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to have a talk about this. We're going to have to do more research on this. So, you know, that's that's good. Now, Courtney, you said also to reach out to Patrick Alderdice. Um, I can't find his information on the the staff directory. So I don't know where to get him. But if you have that information, I'm happy to share it with people. Okay. Um, another thing too is, is the, so the sustainability of the foundation is important and continuing to travel and continuing to educate to and the scholarships. And right now we are one of a very few organizations that actually have a research-based hazing curriculum, hazing prevention curriculum. So also getting that word out there to as many school divisions as we possibly can would be very beneficial Part of our curriculum is, um, Dan's video is part of our curriculum. And then we also have the research base, um, hazing prevention curriculum. So it's instruction that kids should be getting more than just a video. They also do activities. They also get involved. Um, so I think that would be really huge to keep our foundation going is sharing the work that we're doing with the curriculum and knowing that, you know, my dissertation proved that it was effective on the kids that saw it and that were a part of it. So I just think that's important. Well, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on and sharing. So look, I, 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 I know that I've talked to a lot of people who, you know, lose a loved one, lose a child. And I know that every time you come on and you tell the story, I know that you know that you need to, but I know it's not easy for you. <sighs> and so I appreciate you guys, both of y'all, taking the time to share your journey through this and Adam's story because he deserves to be remembered. Things deserve to be, you know, it, it's, it's terrible that something it's terrible that things have to happen. Some mm -hmm. extreme yeah. thing has to happen before change. Ha and even with these extreme things, change still doesn't necessarily happen. And it's just, that's why there's now there's a law named after Adam where there should have never been a situation for him to be in the first place to have had a law named after him. Right. So, but what we're going to do on this is we're, we'll get it uploaded to a podcast and we'll keep talking and, you know, um, we'll try to keep, we'll, we'll keep the momentum going on. I think that right now is a really good time to bring this awareness out. So thank you guys for joining us and thank everybody for listening as well. Thank you, Justin. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate it. your audience. Thanks, is, everyone is too. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>